and minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about fear. We're going to talk about anxiety. Mm. We're going to talk about worry and discomfort. And of course, paranoia. <laughs> comes and, along with it all well who better to have in here to talk about paranoia than someone who made an entire album about paranoia a truly outstanding album yeah. by thank the way lita much. wise is here thank you lee yeah. thank you for being here yeah man i'm uh i'm a fan of your show oh, and dude. um and i like how you guys just get into stuff and you know it's my it's my vibe for sure so well you know we yeah. are we are both big fans Huge of fans, your man. music i didn't know a whole lot about you until i started preparing for this episode the only thing i knew is I feel like you've made two classic albums, and uh, I don't I don't use that word lightly. Like I feel like you've made just I mean you've made quite a few albums, and I'm a fan of your music. But you, you have your frames and and paranoia, and we're here today to celebrate a new EP that you have, Castles. Yeah, I, I just put out a new EP, Castles, uh, a week ago or so, and uh, yeah, it's it's each album is definitely a you know I write different stages of your life, different things going on. You want to make different music. I try not to get too, you know, boring for myself. Uh -huh. You know, I, I try to change it up as much as I can. But Paranoia was definitely one of those albums for me where I was in a different place than I can say I was versus the others. Uh -huh. um, it's probably the darkest album I've made. <laughs> I mean, even with the titles, like, out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. But it was one of those things I feel like I needed to do. I needed to make, like, that album in order to kind of get to this one. And I always feel that way with the music. I feel like... Once I can get this chunk, this puzzle piece, then I can go to the next one, you know? Uh -huh. And, and, and um, yeah, Paranoia was uh, interesting. You say it's dark, but there are moments of light. Like, like I think that's the thing with, with hope and despair. And we're going to talk a bit about the, these topics today with paranoia or maybe lesser states of paranoia, whether it's fear and worry. And we've got some questions from our audience. So I want to talk to you more about your music, but let's dive into some of these questions yeah. first. Emily in Oklahoma City has a question. Hi, this is Emily from Oklahoma City. I had a question surrounding the relationship between physical preferences and resilience. My husband has the mindset that continually disregarding physical preference will build strength and allow you the ability to thrive physically under any circumstance. I was wondering, do you think these two are correlated? And if so, where is the balance between challenging yourself or putting yourself outside of your comfort zone, but also curating a life that is cohesive with your personality and allows you to thrive? Ryan, I don't think I, I totally understand the question here. Uh, I think, I, well, I mean, she's asking about physical preferences versus resilience. So... When I heard this question, I thought about our trips to uh, the Russian bathhouse. So Josh and I, we go to this place called Voda Spa in West yeah. Hollywood. And like they have these crazy hot saunas, 220 degrees sometimes. Right. This cold plunge that can get down to 30 degrees. And it's super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I do not prefer <laughs> to be in a 220 degree sauna. I don't prefer to be in a 30 degree cold plunge. However, there are an extreme amount of benefits to making yourself uncomfortable in those rooms. Uh, and Josh can speak more to those than I can. He's the scientist on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are a lot of benefits, but the benefits also come from uh, the the. Uh, there is a lot of comfort that sort of surrounds that as well, right? If we stay in a, a perpetual state of discomfort, that leads to pain. Yep. Um, if we are always comfortable however that also leads to a particular kind yeah. of pain now now lee in your in your music you you write a lot about well pain and, and discomfort and and the, these emotions that we experience maybe we could talk a little bit about that yeah i think i think there's you know to what you were saying i think there's also a difference between when you've put yourself in those positions and when those situations are out of your control mm -hmm. so i think like when it comes to you know, a lot of the music I write or when I write about something painful or, you know, for me personally, it's a way, it's almost a therapeutic thing where I can relive it, but reliving it may sound to the listener like, wow, are you okay? Are you okay? Sure. Where for me, I'm like, ah, like it feels good. So putting myself in that place to, to write that way. But I think a lot of the time, um, speaking to fear, um, I think fear is one of those things that it's when it's out of your control it changes like who you are as a person. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for me, 
I think that a lot of the songs I write, I'm just trying to relate it back to my music. Um, you're kind of put in a headspace where you might act different than you would normally under regular circumstances. And that's driven by the fear of whatever it may be. So for me, I've had a life, especially the last 15 years of putting myself into very uncomfortable mm -hmm. situations, you know, um, starting with American Idol is a, is a perfect example of that. Um, before that, I was never one to, Hey, look at me or be in a spotlight of any kind. It was mm -hmm. uncomfortable for me. The only place it felt comfortable was when I was on stage performing my own music. That's yeah. that was my comfort zone. Um, being on stage, being judged by people, being on stage, being looked at by millions of people, that was very uncomfortable for me. So as much as I enjoyed getting up there and performing, the setting necessarily wasn't the most um, inviting for me, you know? Right, and also it was different because you did, you accepted it, you, you're the one who signed up for it, so to speak. Where, as opposed to if someone were to drag you on stage when uh, you, you weren't prepared for it, it would have been a completely type, uh, completely different type of, of discomfort. Yeah, and I think I think for some people it's the opposite. The, that limelight, that thing is is where you know they they can embrace it. And I think it just took me a long time to really um, embrace that part of it. What I love about it, what I still love about it, is getting up, playing my songs, telling a story through my music. Like those things I love. I love doing that. Um, but early on, especially when I was younger, you know, it was the it was the fear of the of not knowing what was going to happen next that was really keeping me in it. Just, right. Mm -hmm. right. I think the, the opposite is also true. That there is a, a certain kind of complacency that, that comes from comfort. When Ryan and I were back in the corporate world, in fact, uh, there were certain aspects of, of luxury or comfort. We made really good money in the corporate world. We had you know, supposedly prestigious job titles. And uh, I never had like this really outstanding life, but it was comfortable enough that I was afraid to make a change mm -hmm. because I knew that when I made a change, there would be some sort of pain associated with that. I'm, oh my God, if I have to walk away from this really good salary or these the the benefits or or the supposed job security I, I realized later there's actually no such thing as is job security but at the in, in the moment it felt it felt real but ryan if we could return back to emily for a second mm -hmm. i think both things can be true and i think you actually need you know her husband is uh maybe radically embracing the discomfort and the letting go and and uh a sort of Spartan approach toward toward living, and I think there are there are times for that. However, sure. letting go just for the sake of letting go is also not necessarily beneficial. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said if you're making yourself uncomfortable to a point of pain, and I, and I think that is the key different difference between you know the preferences versus resilience is. Are you doing something that's making you uncomfortable to make you to grow? Because I'm sure it's a lot easier to not write music and to not get on stage. Yeah, I mean, there are times where you, to get inspired, to be totally honest, when you're, and I think this cross, crosses all things, I think, whether it be art, mu any kind of art form, I think it, it, you have to kind of sometimes put yourself in a position where you might not be comfortable because mm -hmm. that's where you'll get some of your best stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, writing, I mean, I oddly enough have a song on Paranoia called Let Go. Mm -hmm. And that song for me, you know, is not, wasn't an easy song to write, like emotionally, you know, it's not like something I sat down and said, this is fun. And it was really, but once I, once for me, when it comes to writing, once I dive into it and I can, I'll never take it to a point where it's, uh, it's all, it's sad, you know, there's those moments of sadness and, and I really can draw from that. It's actually beneficial for me in that way where I can do some of my best writing that way. You know, lots of times people have asked me, especially with this, that album in particular, you know, your song seems so sad. And I'm, you know, I don't tend to write songs when I'm walking around happy and like, you know, like, hey, I'm gonna write a song. That's not right. <laughs> usually my thing. So um, for me, I think putting myself in that position to be uncomfortable, to, 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 to live through some of those pains is important for mm -hmm. an artist, If I, I think, because that's where you can kind of draw some of your most emotional, honest work you know i think people can connect with something when it's honest and i think i think that pain and in, in in those kind of things are things everyone has experienced in some way or another and i almost feel like there's a connection you get with somebody when they're when they feel that you've 
had that same pain. Mm. You know, I think yeah. lots of times with pain and fear and all of those things, you, it, it tends to make you feel alone sometimes. Mm. And mm -hmm. I think when people can feel like you've experienced it as well, there's almost this connection they feel with you. And I think music's a really good vehicle to like bridge that between like people and, and, and those kind of emotions. And I think that's why, you know, my music may resonate with some yeah. people. That's why it resonates with me, man. Like I, yeah, I really enjoy it. So Josh, you mentioned the fear of leaving your job. Mm -hmm. You weren't scared of the pain. You were scared of the discomfort and the comfort prevented you from taking a risk to experience that discomfort. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately, I, I mean, initially I was scared of pain because I never really stopped to to question you've got that 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 line in paranoia another bad line of questioning right like and that's yeah. the thing that really leads to these the, the fear and w what i perceive to be pain right mm -hmm. because it, i thought like well if i leave here then of course all of the worst things that could ever happen are certainly going to happen right. and i didn't even stop to actually ask better questions like and that's the paranoia aspect of it mm -hmm. right. i think fear like fears you have those fears and that that you can almost make sense of it like i'm afraid because this might happen but it's once the fear kind of takes over that's when the paranoia <laughs> starts to set in and now all of a sudden that's when the irrational stuff starts to set in and mm -hmm. and you know you might be afraid like let's say to leave your job but in that moment it's just i'm afraid to leave my job because then what will i do but then it's well then this will happen then this will happen and you have all these things and it kind of takes up a lot of your headspace and we're often we're often saying this is the worst thing that can happen but we're not asking ourselves like what is the best thing that can happen exactly right and, and in some cases like the worst thing that can happen is really bad what's the worst thing that can happen if i jump out of this airplane well i mm -hmm. might die so what should i do maybe i should have a parachute a backup parachute you know, plan for jumping out of this airplane instead of just i'm going to jump out right and but what's the the best thing that can happen in, in some instances um well you know, man, maybe I could start my own business. I can finally write that book I want to write. There are a lot of things I can do. And often, what's the worst thing that can happen? Nothing at all. It, it's fake fears. It's what our friend Julian Smith calls the flinch. Mm -hmm. we, we used to flinch because, you know, a tiger was chasing us. And now we flinch because, oh, no, my 401k lost one-tenth of a percent last week. And, right. and, and we're panicked about it. And that leads to that the, the paranoia that you're talking about. And so many of these fears are actually irrational fears. And occasionally there might be a rational fear and then that's a sign to maybe avoid that thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think just the control of it is another thing. Again, putting yourself in a position where you have to face something that you're afraid of versus being forced into a position where you're you have to deal with something you're afraid of is they're very different for me. You know, if I'm gonna make a decision, okay, this is scary, I'm gonna do this thing, but okay it's i'm afraid of it but i'm gonna like face it versus saying now you're in this position and you don't want to be here and i think the fear can kind of guide how you handle that situation you know what i mean yeah no that that actually makes a lot of sense man like going back to the airplane thing you're scared to jump out of an airplane but if you got a parachute you're a little less scared if you got a backup parachute you're a little less scared if you have someone you're jumping tandem with you're a little less scared but that fear should be an indication of like or all right someone pushes you out right exactly, <laughs> you exactly. know you're like i'm uh -oh. now i'm falling now what I'm do i screwed. do you yeah know I mean? <laughs> well here's here's like here's the like a short answer i would give uh, emily here is it's a it's okay to make yourself uncomfortable like from from discomfort is where growth happens. It is not okay to continue, uh, continually put yourself in a painful situation. That eventually is going to, it's going to lead to negative consequences. Yeah, yeah. If uh, you're, uh, if you are not careful with something, for long enough, it breaks. And I think we need to be, we need to be careful of that as mm -hmm. well. So, yeah, putting yourself in in these moments of discomfort, but in a sort of uh, careful way yeah. is, is sounds to me like where you're going. Emily, yeah. I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. Uh, it's really the story of us going through a whole lot of discomfort, leaving the corporate world, but m much more than that, walking away from a discontented, a discontented life that was no longer bringing us joy or happiness, or in fact, it was leading to this sort of paranoia in a way, like clinging yeah, so hard that it was impossible to let go. And really this five-year journey of of being these suit and tie corporate guys to becoming the minimalists. And I think you'll find a lot of value in that book. Sean, if you would uh, send her maybe the audiobook version, if you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook. Or if you want the book book or the ebook, we're happy to send those to you as well. Nicole from Eastchester, New York has a question. Hi, um, this is Nicole Yezo. I am from... East Chester, New York, 
A big thank you for all your podcasts as you help me to downsize my career as an assistant principal back to a teacher. And although I took a tremendous pay cut, I'm gaining a huge amount of time back in my life to spend with my two young children, which is something that I desperately needed. My question is, is since I stayed in my same industry and actually in my same school district, how do you deal with people thinking you're absolutely crazy and insane for taking such a huge step backwards? Um, without getting into a whole long story of your love affair or my love affair with minimalism and simple living. All right, so I'm going to read this thing from Seth Godin real quick because uh, it, it stood out to me. And then I know Lee has, has a few things to say about this as well. This is called Off Stage. I wonder what Carol King is up to. Did that kid who was in your third grade class 10 years ago get in to his first choice of college? How did that couple that had a squabble in your, in your store last week settle their argument? We don't notice people when they're not in front of us. Of the tens of thousands of people, familiar and famous, that we know, we spend precious little time concerned about the ins and outs of their day. And more poignantly, the same is true for the way the world ignores our day-to-day -day lives as well. Humans' selfish survival instinct is to be aware of whoever is on stage in front of us, and then to move on to the next urgency. I won't read the entire thing. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. But um, I think one thing that that Nicole needs to think about here is most people don't actually care. That's why I bring that up. Like we often think like so many people are concerned about me. Uh, what'd she say? Taking a step back. Right. But I think most of the time, especially when you're not there in front of them, most people don't really care. It's just the w the pressure that we've conceived is all s a self conception. And once we realize that, we can realize that maybe 98% of the, the sort of judgment that we're feeling is us judging ourselves to a great extent. Yeah, I think also it, it comes down to what people on the outside may perceive as like success or uh, what a step forward would be. Mm -hmm. You know, someone may look at someone that's... Um, you know, an actor or a musician and say, you know, why are they doing that? That's a step back. But I think that a step back for someone on my, for themselves might be a step forward where someone on the outside is looking at it as a step backwards. And I think it's very easy to let those outside influences um, affect what you're doing, mm -hmm. where you may say, I'm going to do this thing. And it may, you know, maybe different for me, it might be out of my comfort zone. And then if you listen to those kind of outside voices, if you listen to that thing, there is an element of, of, of understanding why someone might say that, you know, okay, so looking at it from a different angle, I guess. But for me, at least the way I've always tried to, to do things is, you know, I have a goal in mind. And if that goal means I have to take this, take a little bit of a different route this way or that way, mm -hmm. that's fine. And you, everyone, I mean, coming from the spot I've been in, I've been, I've seen all, I've seen all aspects of it from every side. And what you're saying is very true. Most people don't care. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and I think a lot of it's in your head. And uh, I think if you just kind of have a goal in mind, um, it, how you get there, you know, that's up to you. But you can't listen to the outside. I mean, she's talking a lot about people telling me I'm taking a step back. I to me, that's it's almost like irrelevant. Yeah. Well, well, right. And, and the reason it's relevant. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. I don't. There's a reason it's relevant for her though, because these are people that she cares she, about or yeah, respects. She works to, with yeah. to some extent, yeah, and she has to, she's forced to spend time with them, but also realizing that the direction they're headed in may not necessarily be the direction you're headed in, and also the things that make them happy or pleased or satisfied or fulfilled are not going to be the same things that make you happy, satisfied, pleased, or fulfilled. And in fact, the things that make them contented with their life may actually get in the way of your own contentment because their mm. recipe is so radically different from yours. And it's the same thing with food. If you en enjoy a particular food and someone else doesn't enjoy it, then what, you're not supposed to enjoy it now? Yeah. I wonder it how many people are actually coming to Nicole and saying, You've took you've taken a step backwards. You're crazy. I wonder if it's if this is more of an internal thing that's going on Versus with her. Versus feeling like people are thinking that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and I would say like if there are people legitimately coming to her, and they're saying, Nicole, what is wrong with you? You've taken a step back. You've taken a huge pay cut. Um, 
I mean, first and foremost, honestly, I don't think she should care what other people think. But I understand she works with them. I understand that yeah, maybe it's a loved do. one or a friend. Absolutely. Um, so, so my first piece of advice is Nicole. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay attention to your haters. If you've got someone who genuinely is concerned about you, then you can very genuine. You can very genuinely explain how you got your time back, and now you're able to spend time with your kids. And the pay decrease that you took, the position, the lower position that you took, was much more worth uh, that. That opportunity cost was worth having more time for your family and for your kids. Uh, if you're still, you know, paying the bills and you're getting by in life, then it's okay to be content with that. Um, unfortunately, there are people out there though who aren't going to support you. And even if you say, oh, I, you know, I did it for my kids and they might push back and be like, oh, well, you know, if you really cared about your kids, you'd make more money and, you know, be, be able to send them to a better college. I'm just saying there are people out there like that. Uh, and like what you read, you were talking about day to day. Like uh -huh. people don't know the ins and outs in the day to day to what everything is. You know, I think people on the outside have a tendency, no matter what you do, like someone might say to, to you guys, with a podcast like, hey, you just like, go in a room and you do interviews yeah. right like they don't understand the levels and the things you have to do in order just to to do certain things for me r music you know I, I mean the amount of times people have come up to me and said why aren't you why haven't you and it's just i think that there is an element of you know the the person that understands your life the best is you and 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 yes you some people are going to make bad decisions some people are going to make better decisions you yeah. know it's it's but there is a learning process to life you know it's not like it's just laid out like here's what mm. you do to get to where you need to go to yeah. and so especially you know again like for me i can only speak for myself on this but for me i mean there's been so many times where people have questioned whether what i'm doing is the right way of doing it or the wrong way of doing it and for me and by I, the way they're going to do that regardless of what decision you make there are going to be people say, I can't believe you went on American Idol. And then there are other people saying that was the best decision you could have made, right? Right. And, and uh, no matter what decision that you make, out of the infinite choices, there's always, you can always find someone who can criticize it. Of course. It. And, and that's that's going to happen regardless. Um, the, the, the thing that I often... Uh, you hear a site, and in fact, it's a, a line from one of our books, Essential, which I'm going to send a copy to Nicole. It's an essay collection with 150 different essays in it. Uh, the line is, judgment is but a mirror that reflects the insecurities of the person who's doing the judging. Mm. And ultimately, if someone's saying that, that is a bad decision, they're saying, Lee, that is a bad decision if I were to make it for me, right? Mm. Not that's a bad decision for you, or it's a bad de decision for Ryan, or for Podcast Sean, or for Jordan No More over here. They're saying... I'm projecting what a bad decision is if I were to make that, if I were in your shoes. I think yeah. there's a bottom line as well. I think there's like, with around all the decisions you make, like for her, it sounds like her kids, like that's her bottom line. Like as long as I could take, for me, yeah. um, it's like the songwriting. That's my bottom line. If it, if at the, end of, at the end of the day for me, what I try to make sure that is the spine of everything I'm doing is that I can keep the, keep the songwriting at the forefront of what I'm doing mm -hmm. and making sure it's honest and making sure it's the kind of music that I want to be making. So there's like decisions around it. But for me, like I, I try to, I always have that to go back to. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So yeah. yes, there might be a decision to make here to say, I don't know, you know, it's, 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 you don't get to know what's going to happen. But I think if you kind of keep that core goal, like at least for me, I feel as long as that's kind of at the forefront of what I'm doing when I'm when it comes to music, I, I feel good about any decisions I'm making because that's the base of what I'm I'm doing. I love it. Like Nicole, what is your bottom line? Yeah. And like as long as you're aiming towards that, then yeah, no one should be able to make you feel guilty about the path that you've taken to to get to that bottom line. I I totally agree. Like you mentioned earlier about the path, you might have to veer off a little bit. Someone else is looking at it like, oh, Lee's veering off his path a little bit, but you're like, no, I'm actually getting towards what I wanna I wanna get to get to my bottom line yeah and, and once you figure that out it helps you realize you don't have to explain yourself to every person and every decision that you make right. you're not forced to explain yourself and by the way the people who really care about you th they don't require an explanation for every action that you take especially if they feel good about about you and and the decisions you make they may not agree with oh my gosh can't believe you took a step backward at work because again that's their thought you simply know that you took a st step forward in your life by simply changing your position yeah i think if anyone wants to get over uh criticism th they should start a blog 
write an album like get in the public eye because you get so much criticism when you put yourself in the public eye like you've, you've got to get used to it yeah you start developing calluses <laughs> and that's an interesting thing because you know you've, you've heard a lot of people say you know if you're going to be in the public eye you're asking for it mm. right you're asking for it yeah. and i think it's just something that come it does come with the territory when you're in the public eye of course people are going to critique you and judge you and look at what you're doing and 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 say what they think they like or what they don't like but um i think a, an important part is having people around that you that you trust yeah and, and and trusting the people that you've put around you like there's two pieces to that because for me you know through my experience and my you know path um it really all co it's so much easier to make what you make may say are the right decisions or you know feel good about what you're doing when you have people around you that trust you and then and, and that you trust because i think those are the people that are gonna be the most honest with you for instance um person you know x over here who might say i don't know if that's a you know i i don't value it less but if someone that i have a trust and a bond with is like saying the same thing i might look at it a little closer so i just think that it's a way of keeping yourself honest and keeping you know kind of your focus in line but i i just think that the kind of support team you have around you the people you have around you um understanding your goals understanding what it is that you want also mm -hmm. helps in the decision making process when it comes to certain things in your career yeah. or your life you yeah know? that's why i got josh in my life well I he lets me know when I'm, i have crazy ideas and <laughs> but, but we also provide solutions for each other and sure. that's the difference between criticism and feedback criticism highlights a problem feedback highlights a solution and my guess is if these people are coming up to nicole, nicole and telling her i can't believe you did that they're giving her criticism right they're throwing problems her way without a solution that it by the way is applicable to her life and her circumstance nicole enjoy that copy of essential if you want the audiobook it's our longest audiobook i think it's over six hours or if you want the book book or the ebook we'll send you a copy of that as well ryan what time is it it's time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media indeed we do we are at the minimalists on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Lee, your handles are different on a few few platforms here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, apparently, um, when I try when I tried to get my, my own name in certain spots, they're like that's already taken. So I was like, okay, <laughs> um, fair enough. So yeah, uh, it's Twitter. I think is at Lee, just at my name at Lee Dewise, and Instagram is at Lee Dewise Official. There we go. And his website cool. is LeeDeWiseOfficial dot com as well. Uh, during the lightning round, we try to answer questions with just short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our pithy answers in one place, uh, minimalmaxims.com. All right. Or we really just ramble on a little bit and then we sure. tweeze out yeah. something. That Sean is makes it really nice and post. Pretty. We vibe it out. I, I'm, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, first question is from Nicolette. I have a significant fear of being alone or growing old and being alone. It terrifies me. I'm mostly at home, but go out to run errands every day. I'm currently going through a divorce, which is exacerbating the fear. Any advice to calm my intense fear? I have, I have a few pithy answers, but I really want to hear from Lee on this one because you you write about loneliness and being alone, and and um, th that certainly makes it into, into your song. So uh, let's see, real quick, short answer for me is comfort provides a fertile environment for fear to grow that, that's really the paranoia thing we were talking about earlier because once you are you 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 reach a level of certainty where your basic needs are met but then you don't do anything to put yourself in the discomfort zone you don't do anything to grow you start to develop these fears i'm going to lose what i have right and uh the so actually, where, where Nicolette is right now is she's in a place where a lot of things are changing. What I'm trying to warn her against is don't put yourself in, in, a, in, a, mom, in a lifetime of discomfort or of, of comfort rather. Don't put yourself in a lifetime of comfort going forward because you're afraid of uh, developing these, these pains of, of being alone. And that means you're going to have to put yourself in some uncomfortable situations where it means going out and, and meeting people. Because I think, I think a little discomfort is sort of the antidote to fear to a great extent not a tremendous amount you know it's not like well i'm afraid to go dancing well then i think you need to you, you know you need to 
tango or you need to join dancing with the stars or something no it, but but doing something that's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable is actually going to be the place that's going to uh it's going to quash your fears and i also thought about this tweet i sent out a few weeks ago hate is just fear with fangs so fear manifests in a bunch of different ways sometimes we'll lash out at other people you know, I hate you, or, or or we see it online all the time with Twitter and Instagram, people commenting on people's stuff. I think quite often we do that. We rile, try to rile other people up, or we troll other people out of our own fear and insecurity to a great extent. Now, Lee, I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to talk to you about just this fear in general, but fear of of loneliness or being alone. Um, I think a big part of feeling alone that scares people is having to isn't necessarily the fear of not having someone there but it's you know being with yourself 24 mm. 7 all the time like imagine being with someone that you didn't like all day every day every minute of every day by yourself it would be the worst experience so i think wow. there's an element of like being alone that's not so much a fear of not having someone else but it's a fear of having to live with just yourself and okay. and not having um kind of a balance to that and i think that for, at least for me that's I've, I've always kind of viewed it that way um i think some people love being alone yeah. some some people you know that's me it's, I, it's, I spend right the vast majority of my time <laughs> some alone. people love being alone and i think i think some of the, one of the fears that people have that sets in being alone is once you're when, when you've not been alone when you know what it's like to not be alone mm -hmm. and then now you're forced to be in a position or or you're in a position where now you are alone and um it feels like something's missing when in reality maybe something's not maybe things are okay but you have this feeling of like you were saying like i've lost something and i want that back and so the fear is you know it's kind of a it's a double-edged thing because you want to go back out and fill that missing piece but the last time you had that piece it was painful and it was it, it sucked um but i think you know i think it's there's an element of taking time to reflect on yourself and kind of like you know look at yourself when you have those moments of alone mm -hmm. and i think it'll better your chances of getting over the fear of being alone and finding maybe someone else or whatever to fill that void but um you know for me i don't i don't like i, I like being alone but then i always think i like being alone and then if i am i i don't enjoy it at all because i find that sometimes that's when my brain starts to uh -huh. <laughs> starts to turn and then things you know and i think that's where a lot of the fears can come in and a lot of those things and i think when people are afraid they tend they can't act irrationally and like i said you, you'll make decisions based on you know these these false paranoias these these things that aren't just aren't real and and so for me when it comes to like loneliness and when i write about it i guess i've always i'm always having this internal conversation with myself I find when I write, it's always this conversation I'm having with me. Uh -huh. And uh, and I don't know, I've always found loneliness to be one of those things where you talk to some people and they just love it. You know, I love being alone. And people, I think people like to say they like being alone and some people really do. But realistically, I think it's, again, just being stuck with yourself all the time is, is a hard thing to do. Yeah, and so you're really opening my mind up here because if we're not comfortable with the if we don't like the person that we spend the most time with ourselves, then it is going to be very difficult to spend time with that person alone. I, I have no problem. I, I really enjoy being alone. I spend very little time with, I have a family and I spend very little time <laughs> with other people. <laughs> I have a six year old daughter and a wife, but I still, I, I've set my life up so that I spend most of my time alone. I think it's because no one likes me as much as I like me. <laughs> and I, I say that jokingly, but there is something to be said. I don't, I didn't like my former self. I, I didn't like my, my 20 something year old self very much. And so I compensated by having to spend a lot of time with other people, coworkers, networking buddies, executives, uh, people I didn't really share similar values to, but I was kind of afraid of being with myself and having to confront what's going on in here and, and up here. And, and you're forced to deal with those things when you're alone. And mm -hmm. we're terrified of that silence <laughs> and stillness. But once, once you start to deal with it, once you become the person that you want to become or, or you get closer to that, and that's Not, a hard thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And it continues to, you know, it continues to change. I, I'm 38 years old now. I aspire to be my 40 year old self, right? It's a better version of me, hopefully. And, uh, but before I aspired to be a bunch of other people who weren't me, 
who didn't share my values, but maybe they had a shiny car or a fancy job title. But that wasn't me. That was someone else's sort of projection of what I should be. Yeah. It's funny, man. I, Josh uh, has always went and saw movies by himself. And I always thought that that was like something that psychopaths did. And <laughs> we were living in Missoula, Montana. And I was like, why am I uncomfortable with myself? Like, this is really strange that I can't go oh. to a movie by myself. So I actually started going out and doing things by myself to kind of face that discomfort. And uh, I still am an extrovert and love being around people. But I can totally be by myself and be okay. And there's a balance there, right? Like, sometimes I do need to be by myself. Most of the time, I need to be with someone else. But sometimes I do need to be by myself. I got a couple of pithy answers here. Uh, one is giving into fear begets more fear. So if you let full fear rule your life, then you're going to live a fearful life. Yeah. So uh, don't give into it. Consider it. Uh, ask yourself what that fear is doing. But letting it rule your life is is not going to be good. Uh, the second one I have is fear's worst enemy is confidence. So Nicolette, it sounds like maybe you're lacking a little confidence in developing these relationships. I don't see. I don't know to the extent of. Is it agoraphobic? Is that? Yeah, it means you're afraid to leave the house. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if she's like to that extent an agoraphobic or if she's just nervous about making new relationships. But what I'll say is, if it is to a, a point to a disorder, um, you've got to go find someone who can help you get over a certain disorder. Um, if you're not an agoraphobic and you just don't know how to go out and make new relationships, then you can do things like go to meetup.com. There are a million different groups with a million different interests that you can kind of join and uh, go make some friends and, and go mingle. In, but In um, Infinite Jest, uh, David Foster Wallace's novel, there's a, a classroom where um, a teacher is, uh, he he's really interested in these double binds. So he's teaching a, a, a class who are hypothetically agoraphobic, or they're agoraphobes, but they're also kleptomaniacs. And so they have the impulse to get out and steal, 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 <laughs> but they can't leave the house because they're agoraphobic. And, and how do you deal with a double bind like this? And mm. one bright kid figures out, spoiler alert, he figures out uh, mail fraud is a way that you can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can take care of both fears here. What a weird way to so get Nicolette, to a punchline. So uh, mail fraud is what I'm suggesting to you. No, uh, also understanding yourself. We've talked about that. We have a values worksheet on our website. If you go to the minimalists.com slash resources, that should actually be launched by the time this podcast episode comes out. There's a values worksheet there. You print it off. It's three pages. It's going to help you better understand what your foundational values are, your structural values, your surface values, and your imaginary values are so you can get those obstacles out of the way. I think you'll enjoy that. All right. Before we get into our added value segment and our listener tips today, it looks like we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. Indeed we do. What are six tips for dealing with fear and anxiety? How can we lean into fear to make ourselves more productive? How has consumerism fed and increased fear and paranoia in people today? What do Joshua and Ryan and Lee personally fear? Is fear and paranoia genetic? How important is developing emotional intelligence to overcome fear? And I think we have about 600,000 more questions for Lee to Wise. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode. But each week, Ryan and I and our guests record an entirely different, much longer Maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast which gives us the private space we need to talk about topics we don't usually discuss in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement-free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. Find all the details and all the good stuff over at theminimalists.com slash support. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Epstein didn't kill himself. Also, here are some voicemail comments and tips from our <laughs> listeners. Hi, my name is Stefania. I'm calling from St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm calling with a suggestion for your clothing episode. I've been using these socks called Darn Tough. It's a company from Vermont. Um, they guarantee their socks for life. I think all they sell is socks, actually. And while they are a little bit pricey, they do go on sale. Um, and the thought of having socks that will last either my entire life or that will be replaced by the company feels really right, like it's right up my alley. 
Um, I've had these socks for over a year now, and they look as good as new. Um, I have had to return one pair, and the company had excellent customer service, so I highly recommend them. Hey, Josh. Hey, Ryan. This is in response to your podcast, Dealing with Criticism. Uh, There's a quote that I found recently that I've been implementing into my life to really help me. It goes as follows. Treat everyone with politeness, even those who are rude to you. Not because they are nice, but because you are. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Lee DeWise for joining us today. Please check out his new EP. It's called Castles. Three incredibly beautiful songs wherever you get your music these days. Apple, Spotify, etc., etc. You can find it all there. We'll also put a link to his music in the show notes. If you can see him on tour, please do so. He has an incredible live show. Lee DeWise... Um, official.com is his website and real quick for right here right now here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists ryan did you know that scrolling is the new smoking yeah dude all the cool people are doing it (laughs) (laughs) oh that's so true well our good friend dave over at spire um they've created a bunch of different wallpapers for us but one of the most popular tweets of mine is scrolling is the new smoking and I don't even know what my most popular tweet is. I'm gonna well, have to go through them and look. I don't know. I just I asked Jessica, and she just tells me like here are the, the most. <laughs> is there a website things. I can go to and be like, what is my most popular tweet? Uh, yeah, it's Ryan Nicodemus says most popular tweets dot com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, so uh, scrolling is the new smoking. It's the sentiment that like we are we are slowly damaging ourselves in some way, physically sometimes. What, what do they call that now with the, the, the social media neck or, or technology neck where a lot of teens and Gen Z folks are you know, they're bending down so much. It's like oh, yeah. changing the bone structure. Yeah. So scrolling is the new smoking. And uh, a beautiful reminder is we now have a wallpaper. Uh, for your phone or for your desktop computer or your laptop computer, your, for your computer. It's just a reminder, and Dave did a great job because the little scroll on the side also looks like a cigarette. And so it's a beautiful reminder that, hey, it's okay to scroll occasionally, but when we are addicted to our devices, it is not healthy for us. So if you want to download that free wallpaper or any of our other free wallpapers, We have the Love People Use Things. We have the Minimalist logo. We have the Minimalism Subtract logo. We have five questions to ask before buying. Uh, We have several others over at theminimalists.com slash wallpapers, including scrolling is the new smoking. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash the minimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at the minimalists.com. And you'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And for our added value this week, we should definitely play you out with, well, it's the title track to Lee DeWise's album, Paranoia. I really want to just sing this myself. (laughs) Paranoia's cre... All right, I won't do it. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> he spared you. Uh, you know, Lee has such a beautiful voice, and what he did with this song is its amazing. It's a great song. It's a perfect way to end an episode about paranoia. And uh, let's play you out with that. And if you leave here today with one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.